you. Thank you. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope that you understand my accent. My fear is that I talk for a period of time and nobody understands one word I say, so <laughs> so I throw in the odd joke so I know you're listening and you still understand. Um, I want you to know that at the moment I am speaking very, very slowly because I normally speak much faster than this. But um, thanks very much for that very kind introduction, Brendan, and Keisha Labsong. Um, sometimes I am humbled by the things that people say about me, and particularly His Holiness, obviously, and, and others. And so I just am grateful for the kind things and the, the nice welcome that you have given me here tonight and give me and Michael and others when we come here. It is just a wonderful experience for me. Um, what I'm going to do is share my story, my journey with you, and I would invite you to ask questions at the end. Um, and I'm very, I'm very happy to answer any questions that, that you might uh, ask. I have no hang-ups whatsoever. I have no difficulties uh, in relation to anything that I talk about. So please feel free. It's a, it's a fairly relaxed forum for me. Um, I grew up in Derry in Northern Ireland. Um, I was born in 1961. I lived there all my life. And uh, for the first eight years of my life, um, where I lived in a place called the Craigan Estate, was a very peaceful, pleasant place to live. And then around 1969, what seemed like overnight to me, the Craigan became a war zone. Uh, my city became a war zone, and there was bombs, shootings, riots on a daily basis. Um, I remember as a young boy running from one end of the street to the other because where we lived was up high overlooking the city, and you would see the smoke bellowing up into the sky and maybe a a building has been set on fire or a hijacked vehicle. Our streets in the Craigan, they had barricades at the end of each street made out of broken pavements or burnt out vehicles. So it looked and felt very much like a war zone. Um, I suppose the purpose of the barricades in this large estate was to prevent the British Army or the police from infiltrating the area easily. In January 1972, we had what was known and has become known as Bloody Sunday, where 13 people were shot dead by uh, the British Army on the streets of Derry. And arguably, the weeks and months that followed Bloody Sunday were among the most violent period in the history of the Northern Ireland conflict. Many people who were shot dead that day lived very close to where I lived. So it was a very volatile atmosphere. I went to um, Rosemount Primary School and Rosemount Primary School and St. Joseph's Secondary School, um, I suppose we should say Rosemount Elementary School and St. Joseph's High School, were on the edge of the Craigan Estate. And beside the two schools, there was an RUC police barracks. And because of where the police barracks was located, it was a target for the IRA and a target for rioters on a daily basis. Um, eventually, the British Army were brought in to protect the barracks. So you had these 
semi-permanent military installations. We called them lookout posts or sangers or sandbag huts. But basically they were military huts and the soldiers were inside those small huts looking out through a porthole. On the 4th of May 1972, about four months after Bloody Sunday, I went to school as normal. We got out of school about, you know, about, you know, 20 past three. And uh, I and my friends ha ran up through the soccer pitch of the school. As we ran along the bottom of the soccer pitch, I had to pass one of these British Army lookout posts on my right hand side. As I ran past it, a British soldier fired a rubber bullet. The rubber bullet hit me here on the bridge of the nose. I lost this eye and was left completely blind on my left eye. So I'm blind now 43 years next month. Um, What I remember was racing up towards the lookout post. And then the next thing I remember as I woke up and I was lying on the school refectory table where my music teacher, Mr. Giles Doherty, heard the bang. He ran over, found me lying on the ground, lifted me and took me into the, the school refectory. And he put, he put me on the table. And I remember him asking me my name. He said, what's your name, son? And I told him my name was Richard Moore. He got a shock because he knew me very well. I was in his music class, but he wasn't able to identify me because of the extent of the injuries. My nose was completely flattened. My eyeballs were down at my cheekbones and my face was just a bloody mess. The next thing I remember is I woke up in the ambulance. I knew I was in an ambulance because I could hear the siren in the background. And at that stage, my father and my sister were beside me. I only lived about two minutes walk from the school and someone must have went, ran up to my house and told my father that I had been shot. And him and my sister came running down and jumped into the ambulance as I was being put into it as well. I remember my father was holding my hand and he kept saying, you'll be all right, Richard. You'll be okay. And at one stage, one of the ambulance personnel said, there's a woman outside. She's very upset. Will we let her in? And my father must have looked outside and he said, no, it's his mother. Don't let her in. And he said that because he didn't want my mother seeing me in the state that I was in. So I was taken to hospital. I, don't, I, I spent two weeks in hospital. And for the first, first four days, I don't remember anything. Initially, they thought I was going to die from the injuries. Then they thought I might have had brain damage. And finally, they told my parents that I would never be able to see again. And for them, that must have been a terrible shock. I can't imagine, you know, how they, how they felt about that at that time. I spent a week in intensive care. And then after, after the first week, I was moved out into the general ward at the hospital. And I was a, a soccer fanatic. I love playing soccer. Um, and I, uh, I remember joking with a, a young boy who was in the bed opposite me. I remember saying to him, I can't wait to get these bandages off my eyes. 
I'll teach you how to play football or soccer. Not realizing that I would never play football again. And for my family, that must have been very difficult. I come from a big family. There were 12 children in our house, nine boys and three girls. And I was the second youngest. So because there, it was such a serious incident, they all kept a constant vigil around my bed. So for them hearing me talking about removing the bandages and being able to see again, must have been very difficult. And they must have wondered how they were going to tell Richard he was never going to be able to see again. Um, after two weeks, I got out of hospital. And about a month after I was shot, my brother Noel took me for a walk up and down our back garden. And he said to me, Richard, do you know what has happened to you? And I said, no. Or I said, yes, I knew I was shot. He said, do you know what damage was done? And I said, no. And he said, well, you've lost your right eye and you will never be able to see again with your left eye. And I accepted it like that. I literally took it in my stride that day until that night when I went to bed. And when I was in bed on my own, I cried for the one and only time that I remember about blindness. And I cried because I realized for the first time that I was never going to actually see my parents' faces again. And you know, the 10-year-old boy, you don't think about the bigger things in life. You don't think about getting a job. You don't think about your education. You don't think about coping even. I just felt this enormous sense of loss that I was never going to see my parents' faces again. And I cried myself to sleep that night. The next day I got up and got out of bed and began to put the pieces of my life back together. And I would always say, you know, that day was the first day of the rest of my life as a blind person. I eventually returned to school. Uh, I went back to my old school and then went you know, to the high school, done all my exams, went to university. I got married in 1984. Um, I got my degree in 1983. I have two children, Neve and Enya. Neve is 26 and Enya is 23. Um, I'd done a lot of things after I was shot. I, I learned how to play the guitar. And uh, I played in bands in, in Ireland. Um, and also me and my girlfriend then, who's my wife now, we set up a folk choir that sings at mass on a Saturday night. So if you ever happen to be in Derry on a Saturday night and <laughs> looking for somewhere to go, I'm just checking you're still there. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I was compensated by the British for being shot. And with half the money, I bought a house. And with the other half, I bought a pub. And two years later, I bought a second pub. So by the time I was 20 years of age, I owned two pubs in the center of Derry. And if you know anything about the Irish, <laughs> a pub is a good investment <laughs> and uh, so you know I, I, I did a lot of things after I was shot you know I, I got involved in many things I kept my interest in, in soccer up I became a director of Derry City Football Club I'm sure you've all heard of Derry City Football Club it's the greatest club on the planet. And, <laughs> and after tonight, you'll all be following Derry City, won't you? But, uh, and uh, I, uh, 
you know, but during my self-employed years, when I came out of university, I, I, I went straight into running the business. And I'd done that for about 14 years. And during my self-employed years, I had plenty of time to reflect on me and my story and why I was so happy and content with blindness and what happened and all of that. And I suppose I began to re realize it, you know, how lucky I was. And the reason why I tell you I'm telling you all about my achievements. I'm taking you on a journey. And through taking you on that journey, I hopefully will help you appreciate the things that I think in my life were important. And um, I think I survived blindness and not only survive blindness, but feel blindness as a positive experience. And survived losing my eyesight in such a traumatic way because of four things. And I'll mention the first three. Firstly, I think I survived it because I come from a good family. Secondly, because I come from a good community. And thirdly, Despite the difficulties and the poverty that existed in Northern Ireland back in the 70s, I still had choices and opportunities available to me, even as a blind person. And I began to realise that there were many children in other parts of the world that might have had their eyesight, but didn't have what I had didn't have those opportunities that I had. So eventually, I sold out the business and I set up uh, Children in Crossfire. And that was in 1996. So we are celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. Over those 20 years, we have supported projects in Africa, Asia and South America in countries like Malawi, Mozambique, Kenya, Colombia, Brazil, Bangladesh, Ghana, Guinea, and so on. Today, we work in Tanzania and Ethiopia. And we work with some of the most vulnerable children on the planet. Children that suffer every day from the injustice of poverty. For me, poverty is not an issue of charity. Poverty is an issue of justice. And what I mean by that is, these children are not looking for a handout. They're not looking to be treated any differently. They just want the same things that you and me expect for our children. They just ask to be protected in the same way that you would like your children protected. Now, I could talk to you all day about children in Crossfire, but I'm just going to touch on one uh, project briefly, and then we'll show you a short DVD at the end. Is that okay? I was in Ethiopia about two weeks ago. And the first time I went to Ethiopia was in 2008. And the people that invited me out there, when they met me at the airport, they took me to a graveyard. But not to visit the dead, to visit the living. And there was 260 people living and sleeping on top of graves. At least 50% of them were children. These children sold their bodies. The young girls sold their bodies as child prostitutes on the streets of Addis Ababa just to earn a few cents 
to feed themselves and their families. Young girls, that size, eight or nine, seven or eight years of age, selling their bodies on the streets of Addis Ababa just to get money for food. They were malnourished. They were very sick. There were even five or six blind people in the graveyard. They had no electricity, no running water, no food, and no toilets. Some of them at that time had been living in the graveyard 18 years. They went in as children themselves and now had families living in these little makeshift houses made out of plastic bags or bits of wood or whatever. When I was there, there was a tropical rainstorm. And all 260 people were sitting on the ground in front of me in the mud. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them. And I could hear the children coughing and wrenching. It was horrific. The human excrement was being carried by the rain down through their graveyard and down through their homes where they had to sleep that night. You know, I personally feel it's a terrible, shameful affront of mankind that children have to live like that in today's world. And, you know, all as the parents are asking for is that those children have the same human rights that me and you have. That they're, be, that they're protected the way that our children should be protected. That they have the same opportunities that our children have the right to have a roof over their head, the right to be safe from physical and mental and sexual abuse, the right to an education, the right to a future. That's all they're asking for. I'm glad to say the children of Crossfire got involved in that project and initially we started a feeding program and then we uh, employed a teacher to come in and set up a, a school underneath the tree where the children started to get educated. And a, a nurse come in every week or two to check for illnesses and stuff. And in 2010, two years afterwards, after we got involved, we eventually bought these small condominiums. And all 60 families, 260 people, moved into these small condominiums. And I was out two weeks ago, and the children met me at the front of the condominiums, and they were singing, they were dancing, and then they took me into the school that was all built and purchased by children in Crossfire. And they were being fed, there are small bottles of milk and food and, you know, proper teachers. And the parents are involved in businesses such as broom making, brush making, mushroom growing, etc. And, you know, when I drove away in the car, it was a nice feeling to know that I was part of a picture that changed the lives of those children, hopefully forever. Another aspect of our work is, I, Children in Crossfire philosophy is that you can't just deliver projects overseas in Tanzania or Ethiopia. It's very important that we educate people in Ireland and wherever we can on global justice issues. So we work with teachers in Northern Ireland, trying to train teachers on methods 
that they can use in the classroom to get children to engage and be sensitive to global issues. So we have what I describe as a two-pronged approach. And you can't do one without the other. Otherwise, I think it would be out of balance. Um, I'm not the only person that suffered as a result of my blindness. My mother and father suffered enormously. My parents were two very devout Catholics. They went to Mass every day. They weren't political in any way. They didn't support violence in any way. And you know, in January 72, as I mentioned, you have Bloody Sunday. My uncle, my mother's brother, was shot dead on Bloody Sunday. And then four months later, I was blinded. So despite their best efforts to avoid the troubles, the troubles found us. And overnight, their world was turned completely upside down. And I remember when I got out of hospital, my, I was lying in my bed at night, and my mother would come in and kneel down beside my bed. And she thought I was sleeping. And she would start to say her prayers. And then she would start pleading with God. Look, God, he's only a 10-year-old boy. Please give him back his eyesight. Please give him back his eyesight. And she wasn't saying it in the cool, calm way that I'm saying it today. She was broken-hearted. And then I would pretend to wake up, and she would pull herself together. My daddy, he stood in the street and cried the day that he came back from the hospital after they told him that I would be blind for the rest of my life. And you know, um, a few years ago I wrote my autobiography. My daddy died in 1978. So I never ever got the real proper chance to talk to him about me or how it all affected him. So I started to write my autobiography around 2004. And I, I started to research it and speak to my brothers about my parents and about different things that I wouldn't be aware of at the time. And one of my brothers told me that the day the doctors told my father that I would be blind for the rest of my life, my father said to the doctors, can I give him my eyes? And my father was an unemployed shoemaker. He had nothing to offer, only his eyesight. And I thought... It was one of the greatest acts of compassion and love that he, could, he couldn't give anything else. He hadn't got money. He had nothing. All he could offer was his own eyesight. So I decided that I would immortalize that phrase, and I, I called my autobiography, Can I Give Him My Eyes? Um, for me... I'm a very happy and contented blind person. I really am. I, I rarely think about blindness. You know, it's not like I woke up this morning and thought, oh, blind today again, or go to bed tonight, oh, blind tonight again. I, I never think about it. In fact, there's times I forget that I'm blind. And there's some good things about blindness as well, like I don't have to look at you when I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so it makes this job a bit easier. Uh, and, um, but also when you're blind, you know, you're on the receiving end of so much generosity, so much kindness. I meet people and experience people in a different way from you because my needs are different. You know, I, I always tell about the story. I, I go to, I travel from Derry in Northern Ireland to Belfast, which is about 70 miles. And I normally get the bus and I travel on my own. And, you know, one day I was on the bus and 
this person, this lady behind me, tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, look, my name is Mary. And I just want you to know that I'm sitting behind you. And if you need anything, just turn around and ask. And then when the bus pulled into Belfast, she said to me, where are you going now? And I said, I'm going, I'm going to get a taxi. And she said, well, I'll take you to your taxi. And that type of mindfulness, that type of gentle approach, I experience a little bit more than you, possibly, because I need it. And I love it. And it's one of the greatest things that I love about blindness. Um, but I would be less than truthful if I said there wasn't times in my life when I missed my eyesight. Of course there is. For example, when my two daughters were born, Neve and Enya, I was there in the ward when they came into the ward for the first time. I would have given anything to see them. I would still give anything to see my children. You know, when they opened their eyes for the first time. And I, I remember when they made their first communions and their confirmations and they walked up the aisle of the Craigan Chapel and I was sitting there in the chapel with all the other parents and everybody telling me how beautiful they looked and I couldn't see them. In those moments, I miss my eyesight. In those moments... I thought about the British soldier that shot me. And I remember one of the times in the Craigan Chapel thinking, does the soldier ever think about me? Does he ever think about the legacy of what happened that day? But despite all of that, I never had a moment's anger or a moment's hatred. And when you think about anger, Anger is a self-destruct emotion. It's like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. You know, if I had been really angry, it wouldn't have affected the soldier, would it? It wouldn't have made any difference to him at all. The only person that would have been affected by my anger is me. So I'm really glad to say that I have never felt that anger. To the point where I wanted to meet the British soldier that shot me. But I didn't know his name until 2005, 33 years after I was shot. And his name's Charles. And in January 2006, I flew to Scotland on my own and met Charles for the first time. And they sit in a hotel foyer at a table opposite the man that blinded me for life and caused all those hurts to me and my family all those years ago. And to like him was an incredible experience. And me and Charles talked for four hours and three quarters. And it was fantastic. It was one of the most amazing uplifting experiences of my life. It's one thing to be able to, it's one thing to forgive somebody. It's another thing to be able to tell them you forgive them. And um, I learned two things about forgiveness that day. The first thing is, forgiveness is first and foremost a gift to yourself. And what do I mean by that? Well, if Charles wants my forgiveness, he has it. But that's not what's important. What's important is for me in here, in my heart, for my happiness, for my peace of mind, that I forgive Charles. So it's not about the other person. It's about you. So forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. The second thing about forgiveness is 
It doesn't change the past, but it does change the future. And again, what I mean by that is the fact that I forgive Charles won't give me back my eyesight, will it? But what it did do and has done is change my future. And I genuinely believe that I wouldn't be the person that I am sitting up here in front of you today and having done all the things that I've done with my life so far if I had have been wrecked with anger, bitterness and hatred. So forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does change the future. And you know, I genuinely think if we are to have true reconciliation in our lives, it's got to start with you. Too often, I think, we look for the solutions somewhere else. We look for other people to provide the answer. I think if you're to really reconcile, it starts with you. I'll tell you a story about my mother. Shortly after I was shot and I got out of hospital, we lived in a small house. So I, whatever is going on in one room, you could hear it in the other room. And I remember sitting in our living room and my brother, who was about 16 at the time, was out in the kitchen with my mother. And he was very angry. And in very colourful language, he was saying to my mother, they murdered my Uncle Jared. They blinded Richard. We need to get our own back. We need to take the law into our own hands. And my mother said, if you want to help Richard, go you in there and you help Richard. But you're not helping Richard by hurting somebody else. And I think that day, my mother drew a line in the sand. I think that day, my mother helped break the cycle of anger and hatred that has been handed down from generation to generation. And she drew, or she rewrote the future. And any notions of forgiveness that I have, I get it from her and my daddy. I am a victim of the Northern Ireland conflict. There's nothing I can do about that. But I refuse to be a victim of anger. And there's plenty I can do about that. You can take away somebody's eyesight, but you can't take away their vision. And my vision is the work that I'm doing with children in Crossfire. My mother prayed hard that I would get my eyesight back. And I never got my eyesight back in the physical way. But I think I got eyesight of a different nature. So I think my mother's prayers were answered. And as Brenton mentioned, one of the reasons why I'm here in America is to try in some way get support. Not for me. Not for children in Crossfire. But for those children on the other end of the world who need somebody to care about them. So I, I'm going to ask Michael to play a very short DVD of our work. Are we all right? We need Rampouche. We need help. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this DVD, it's only about three minutes, but it covers very briefly the work that children in Crossfire have been doing in Tanzania. 
and Ethiopia. If it works. I hope you know what's happening because I haven't got a clue. Children, patients in Tanzania and 
Nokia has improved nutrition through our therapeutic feeding and home care farming program. Over 13,000 families in the Kilimanjaro region of Tanzania have benefited from our nutrition awareness program. Approximately 12,000 children across Tanzania are accessing a better quality preschool education. 450 children with cancer have accessed life-saving drugs and clinical services. The only thing I would say when you watch that is to examine how you feel when you see those children. Because that's compassion. And then ask yourself if that was your child up there on that screen. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, when he was last in Derry, uh, in 2013, spoke at an event about educating the heart. And uh, what our work, Children and Crossfire's work in Northern Ireland focuses on, is trying to get people and children and young people to empathize with those children that you just saw there. And when you can react to a situation like that, the same way you would react if it was your own child, then in my view, that's compassion. But compassion alone is not enough. And I think His Holiness talks about that as well. It's important that compassion leads to action. And when I look at my own story, why am I doing the work that I'm doing? Why am I, why did I set up Children in Crossfire? The reason why is because of my parents and because of all the things that I talked to you about at the start. Family, community, friends. I've been on the receiving end of so much help and so much kindness and so much compassion that I set up Children in Crossfire just to try to give it back. And if, if me losing my eyesight can change one child's life, then it's worth it. So thanks very much for listening and your patience. Hope you haven't fallen asleep. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The soldier. Yeah. So the the question is that you're curious about the conversation I have with the soldier. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Charles was 34 years of age when he shot me. He was a he was a captain in the British Army, and then he retired a major. But Charles spent 40 years in the military. And his father was in the military before that. And his father was in the military. So Charles is a very different type of mindset from, say, me. You know, it have a very military mindset. So it's important that, you know, that when, you talk, when we talk about Charles, that we see his response to what happened to me in that context. Um, I think Charles would feel that, or, you know, didn't experience any guilt about what happened. And he didn't, uh, he didn't think about me too much. 
but he did think about me from time to time. I have to be honest and say, well, I didn't want to meet somebody that was riddled with guilt. I didn't want to meet a gibbering wreck, someone who couldn't cope because of what happened. So I'm glad that he didn't suffer as a result of what happened. I think Charles justifies what happened in his own mind. Um, when I met Charles for the first time, I remember exactly what I said to him because I rehearsed it in my head for about three months before I met him because I was afraid I would start to cry or something and not get it out. But I said to Charles, look, Charles, I am not here today to make you feel guilty. I'm not here to be confrontational and I'm not here to make you accountable to me. I am here to let you know that I forgive you and I've always forgiven you. I have no hatred towards you and never had. But I had two questions. Because when we communicated initially, I wrote a letter that was hand delivered to him. And then he responded. And in his letter that he wrote back, he said that he didn't feel guilty and he said that he felt justified. So I was a bit curious about that, as you can imagine. So I asked him two questions. The first question was, was he saying that I was a rioter? Because at the time, when I was shot, the propaganda machine clicked into place and they said that I was a young hoodlum. And I wasn't. I was at the bottom of the school playground. And uh, I, so I said, Charles, are you saying that I was a rioter? And he said, no. He said, Richard, I didn't even see. So then I asked the big question, which was, in your letter you said you felt justified. And I find it hard to believe that you can justify the blinding of a 10-year-old boy. And he said, what I meant by that, Richard, is when I made the decision to fire the rubber bullet, I felt it was the right decision. But if I had known the damage that I was going to cause to you, then I wouldn't have fired it. And I wish now I had never fired it. So I am not justifying the blinding of a 10-year-old boy. So I just accepted that as a good answer. Does that answer your question? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, we get our funding from the Irish government. Uh, last year we raised about, say, roughly $4 million. Uh, at least probably around six or 700000 of that comes from the Irish government, their overseas aid program. Um, another trust and foundation gives us about $800,000. We raise about seven or $800,000 from the general public in Northern Ireland. And then there's other various bits and pieces comes in through smaller trusts and foundations. So that's where we get all our money. So we have a couple of income streams, you might say. Um, and so that's, that's where it all comes from. Thank you. Uh, that's a, uh, you know, that, that sometimes can be difficult, but um, I, I suppose in each country we have a strategy and we also work with local partners, local organisations on the ground. So we really don't deliver the work directly. You saw on the DVD there, for example, or in the video, uh, you know, St. Luke's Hospital. So we would support St. Luke's Hospital to deliver a nutrition programme. So they decide, local people there decide, who, you know, 
uh, who they're going to work with and who they're going to help, and then we fund that. But there is, you know, a lot of people that need help. You know, that nutrition program, for example, I was out in the villages two weeks ago, and I went to where we are supporting projects, but I also went to where we're not supporting. And the difference is incredible. You know, their children drinking dirty water. There are children who are severely malnourished who probably won't see their fifth birthday or whatever. Um, but what we try to work with the hospital in that particular instance to deliver what they're trying to deliver. And, you know, um, unfortunately, there are people that they just can't reach. And so what we try to do is just with, as we raise more money, then we could scale up the project, you know? Thank you. So, and your your question is, how do I see the difference? Yeah, and how do I guess go about facing those struggles? Uh, well, I should always say, and I sometimes forget to say it, and so thanks for giving me the opportunity because I forget to say, you know, forget for me, forgiveness was easy, and that's the truth. I didn't climb a mountain. I didn't get over this major hump in the road or anything. Forgiveness became, was very natural for me. Uh, and when I meet a lot of people in Northern Ireland and other parts of the world who are really struggling with forgiveness, then I realize the gift that my mother gave me, really. Um, and I really appreciate it. So I do understand that it is very difficult. And I suppose when I share my story, I share my story in the hope that somebody can see a way out of how they're feeling, a way out of the struggle and the difficulty that they're facing, because forgiveness does offer that. You know, and it's one of those core values that no matter what religion you are, no matter if you have no religion, compassion and forgiveness is a core value that we've all got. I suppose... Um, for anybody that's that's struggling, and you know, I'm aware, and you know, here in, in 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 America of all the various challenges that exist in communities, and you know, it's on the news and and that back home, and you see it as well. You know, I think that people have got to start with themselves. I think. For you to move on from how you're feeling, you've got to start to find a way that you can reconcile within yourself. Don't expect anybody else to provide that because it may not come. And I'll give you an example, right? You know, um, when I met Charles, the soldier, Charles never said sorry. And him and I used to come and do talks like this together. And people would say to Charles, are you sorry? And he would, in his English way, would say, oh, no, actually, I haven't, I haven't been asked to apologize, or do I feel I need to apologize? And everybody's going, this sharp, and take a breath, saying, did he just say that? In front of the guy that he blinded, you know, I can sense it. And... Uh, you know, but I always felt in my own way that Charles was sorry. I really did, right? But 
about six years after me and Charles met, we were doing an event in Derry, my hometown. And I always try to prepare Charles because he's not the most politically correct person. <laughs> <laughs> and so I try to sort of prepare him for some of the conversations. And that particular night, we were going under the Craigan, where I lived, where I was shot, and where a lot of people suffered at the hands of the British Army. So I, I said, look, Charles, we're going under the Craigan. Now, this was six years after me and Charles met for the first time. I said, Charles, look, we're going under the Craigan tonight. And you're probably going to be asked a sorry question. So I just want you to think about how you answer it. And I said, Richard, I am sorry. And that was the first time that he ever said sorry. And I just realized, you know what? He's on a journey too. And I'm just a hundred miles down the road ahead of Charles. And by me not forcing him to say sorry, he was able to say sorry in his own time. And by me not needing him to say sorry, I was able to move on. And when you have someone who you need to release you from what you're feeling, then they hold a key to a chamber in your heart that prevents you from moving on. But when you don't need that, I didn't need Charles to say sorry. I forgive him unconditionally. Then nobody held any keys over my heart and my ability to move on. So what I would say to you, and you're talking about the situation here, then I think people have got to start with themselves. Now, the other important thing I think I should say is, the fact that I forgive Charles doesn't mean it's right. What Charles did was unjustifiable and unjustified. It was wrong. He should have never blinded a 10-year-old boy. So the fact that I forgive him doesn't mean it's right. So the things that are happening in your community here, the fact that people can forgive doesn't mean that it's okay to do it. It just means that you're finding happiness in the middle of that. And more widely, I think, and I'll, I'll stop talking after this, right? But more widely, I think, that why did Charles blind me? Why did Charles think it was okay to fire a rubber bullet at a group of children? There is a society behind him and the community that he comes from that leads him to believe what he's doing is okay. And we've got, and there's loads of people in Northern Ireland from right across the whole political spectrum who did things that their communities supported. And I think here, you've got to question a society that allows people to think it's okay for them to do what they do. And whether that be shooting a gun at a black kid running away, that's an incident. The person has to deal with that directly. But they also, you also have to question a society that allows a guy to think it's okay for him to do something like that. And then tackle that. And I believe tackle it through education. And let's go back to what the Dalai Lama talks about. If you can begin to educate the heart, then I believe without a shadow of a doubt that incidents like that would not happen. So maybe you're not going to change it overnight. But if you start the process now, in 10, 20 years' time, you could be looking at a different situation. Thank you so much, Richard. Thanks. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to thank especially Richard for sharing his... Um, uh, sharing, I mean, Richard is a living example of many of the things that we've studied in places like this, and uh, it's, it's extremely
Okay. Um, Yeah. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Yeah, welcome. That's great, thanks.